Now, on this Invest Talk podcast, Justin Klein listens to your questions. Starting to learn more about value stocks rather than growth stocks. You guys are saving me a, a lot of money. And provides unbiased answers. All right. Well, you're looking at historical blue chip names, and they've endured. Their brands have endured. Invest Talk. Over 42 million downloads and counting. Across America and around the world, your participation makes it unique. 888-99-CHART. At a time when investors are confronted with market volatility and a variety of challenges fueled by the uncertainty of inflation, unsettled geopolitical tensions, and economic pressures, Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to take your finance and investment questions and share their unbiased answers. This is Invest Talk, independent thinking, shared success. Invest Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, financial advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. It's our Monday, June 27th, 2022 edition. I am Justin Klein, and I look forward to this hour with here, with, with you here, uh, answering your finance and investment questions. And as always, I am going to give you my straight and unbiased answers. No hidden agenda, just giving you the facts as I see them and using my 20 plus years of investment experience to give you some perspective as well, helping you understand the cycles, the good times and the bad, because I've seen a few throughout my career, uh, as well as studying a lot of history. And you have to do that in this business. You have to understand the history of different asset classes, different markets uh, in order to identify the opportunities as well as the risks so that you're not making mistakes you're not uh you're not following the herd in over over the cliff right and that's the thing that most people get caught up in they chase returns and not good investments unfortunately but my job is to keep you focused on the good investments on the good risk versus rewards for you. And today's investing situation is very different than what we've seen over the past few decades. So you have to adjust accordingly. Higher inflation, which means not just focusing on the downside of markets, which most people they have that PTSD, 08, they think the next recession, next bear market is going to look just like that last one. Guess what? History says absolutely does not. It looks very different. And so you need to focus on how higher inflation impacts your portfolios, your different asset classes that you might hold. So my goal is to help you navigate this market successfully and become a better investor. So I invite your phone calls and questions right now on our Anytime toll free number 888 chart. So let's get right to our first listener question now. And it's going to be Jordan, just the city south of me in Dana Point looking at VRTX, Veritex, Vertex, excuse me. You own it? Hi, Justin. It? Thanks for taking my phone, yeah. phone call. Uh, I own it. Um, it did quite well for me, but starting to trend down. I'm wondering if I should sell it uh, while I'm still up. I'm up by like 35%. Okay. Now you're saying it's starting to trend down. Uh, yesterday it looked like it closed at a 52 week high. So it doesn't look uh, like it's in downtrend to me. Am I seeing, are, are we talking about the same company? VRTX, Veritex Pharmaceuticals? Yeah, it looks like, I mean. It did pull back oh, in April, yeah. May, but yeah, it's, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm looking at the five day. Sorry. Yeah, so I mean, it was down today, uh, down five bucks, a little over two percent. So, but that's one day. There's there's really, and that's not uncommon to see a stock hit a 52-week high and have a a bit of a pullback. 
so this is a name that it's in the biotech sp space. It's one of the more profitable ones, consistent profitability. L last time I lost money was 2015 and has grown its profits pretty much consistently ever since. So it's a, it's a strong performer fundamentally, uh, technically it's absolutely fine. Relative strength is 98, which means it's outperforming 98% of the stocks in the market uh, and doesn't pay a dividend, but has very little debt. And, you know, I'm fine with it. It's not expensive or cheap. I would say it's about fair value. So if you're up on it, maybe this is a time hitting a 52 week high where you think about rebalancing it, bringing it back down to uh, a, a more comfortable percentage of your portfolio. If it's overweight, that's probably the only thing I would, I would think about being the fact that it's about fairly value. So I would hold it. It looks fine to me. Thanks for the call. Now, my focus point today is based on this headline. Investors are saying no to risky growth stocks, and especially SPACs. And the once Wall Street's hottest ticket, SPACs, they've been one of the most hated trades this year. So we're going to look in the details and why that might be. I also have some other things on the docket. What are companies doing when it comes to their financing costs? This is a big factor. Typically, recessions are driven by rising costs, and sometimes that's rising costs of goods and services, which we're getting now, but also rising costs of financing. And that can drive decision making both on the personal level, think mortgages and car loans and, and credit card loans, but also in the corporate space where a lot of money is borrowed to invest in the business and higher cost capital can mean tightening belts. Uh, and we're going to look at that. Also, muni funds, leverage muni funds. This is something that a lot of people have been hurt by chasing yield, looking at these closed end funds yielding nine, 10, 11, 12 percent. And that's well and good when interest rates are dropping and everything's good within the bond market. But obviously, over the past six, seven, eight months, that's not been the case. So what has happened in that space and what risks are there that remain? And then lastly, we're going to look at the job market and the trend within companies rescinding job offers. All right. So that's what's on my docket for today. But ultimately, I want to know what's on your mind. 888 chart is how you get through and ask your question on today's show. Now, the S&P was down just a bit today, 11 points. So modest down day there. The NYSE, that closed up 23 points. So it was really a flat to, uh, a flat to up day. The Russell was up six points. The N Like I said, the NYC up 23 points. So really, large cap growth was hurt the most. Why is that? You had a little bit of rebound in rate, seven basis point increase in the 10 year up to about 3.2% on the close after hitting on Thursday about 3%. So we're kind of in this range now, backing and filling between three and three and a half percent on the 10 year. And, you know, the, I think the rebound in the market was over the past week was a realization that commodities are pulling back and that's going to feed through inflation numbers that's going to likely feed into monetary policy that may be still tightening, but not as the same pace as we've seen 50 75 basis points per meeting. Uh, and I think that that realization could bring a relief rally in the market that may last more than just a week or two, it might be a month or two. So we'll, we'll see. But uh, that was the market today kind of flat up unless you were in large cap growth, which we've been warning about not a place to be. Now, it's an Invest Talk Monday. We are fast moving towards the 4th of July holiday, just one week from today. But for now, we're moving into a break. And I'm here on duty, ready to answer your questions. So give me a call at 888-99-CHART. Why do listener questions make Invest Talk better? Which of these would you recommend? Because each caller presents fresh questions in their voice. I was curious if you still think aluminum has a ways to go from here. When do I know the right time to take 
profits. Should I be looking for an exit? Should I be holding here? And listeners instinctively realize that Invest Talk uniquely offers a welcome dose of investing satisfaction. I think you have a terrific show, and I've learned a whole lot. Hey guys, love your show. Uh, I've been listening for several years now, and I've learned a lot. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley understand what investors need and want. I would look at it from a tax perspective. If there's no tax implications, move on, find better ways to use that money. I'm going with the odds. I think a half position now would at least get you in it and get you watching it so you won't lose track of it. Don't forget to call Investor 888-99-CHART. One of the most rewarding things I do each weekday is host the Invest Talk podcast. I truly enjoy helping investors, and I know that every question counts and every answer I provide will be unbiased. So as long as your questions involve the stock market or general investment topics and definitions, we set no limits. You, the caller, get to chart the course for each Invest Talk podcast. Justin and I are ready. Are you? Call with your questions anytime, day or night, 888-99-CHART. Let's go over to Kansas City and talk with Jay, looking at EEFT. Do you own it or looking to buy it? Yes. Uh, looking to add a small position, actually, uh, to okay. and it's Euronet. And what they do is they have a lot of those ATMs in airports overseas. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, when you get off the plane and... Madrid or Barcelona or in Europe mainly, mm-hmm. and you need to get cash out and get euros. That's their specialty and was recently overseas about a month ago. And believe it or not, there are lines at those blue and yellow ATMs and just kind of wondered what your take was on, on that company. And it's kind of short term uh, how we're looking. Thanks for taking the call. I always learn a lot and listen. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks for giving us a call. Now, this is Euronet Worldwide. And this is interesting. Interesting name because clearly there is risk with travel. uh, But travel has rebounded in a big way. And they earned $7 pre-pandemic 2019. And then it fell to $282 in 2020. uh, Sorry, 2021. uh, $3.70. And about 70 cents. I expected this year to make over seven dollars, so go past the 2019 earnings level and then go all the way up to nine dollars and 37 cents next year. And if that's the case, it's trading at a 12, 11, 12 times forward looking earnings, which is relatively cheap, strong return on equity. And I kind of like this to be honest with you now. Certainly there's recession risk and the fact that if more people are laid off, less money in their pocket to go travel, uh, that's certainly a a risk. But there's also a lot of pent up demand, people that want to go on big trips or go over to Europe, travel around the world and, uh, you know, you know, catch up after uh, two years of being shut, shut out. So I'm going to give this a thumbs up. The fundamentals are strong. The free cash flow remains consistent. Yes, it had the dip, but uh, even with that dip, it's uh, already back to near pre-pandemic levels. So I'm going to give EEFT Euronet Worldwide a thumbs up. Let's go talk to Tony in San Diego looking at VLAAX, a mutual fund, which would be Value line asset allocation investor. Do you own it or looking to buy it? I'm looking to buy. Okay. So this would be a large cap. This is a blend, really. It has, uh, let's look at its overall Let me look at portfolio. I'm just getting this up here. So it has about 67% in US equities, 27% fixed income, about 5% cash. So you're mainly invested on the equity side in large cap growth. Uh, so Danaher, Internet, Intercontinental Exchange, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Cintas, those are some of the few of the top holdings into it. MasterCard, it's not your typical large cap growth, not your Amazons and Googles of the world. So I like that, that it's a bit more diversified, but I don't like that it's still focused on the large cap growth side of the market. Uh, and 
you have some, and then you have an expense ratio over 1%, 1.03%, which for a blended fund of just a mutual fund, you know, I think that's pretty expensive in my mind. Uh, what What's making you look at this name? Well, it's diversified and it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's a uh, value fund. It says value, so I don't know. Well, just, okay. So this is a good example. Just because it says value in the title doesn't mean that it is a value fund. So value line is an ass is a uh, fund family, but that does not mean that the investments inside it are actually that va- are actually value investments. Okay, and if you understand the portfolio makeup, you'll realize that most of the companies are in the large cap growth side. That's where it kind of leans. Uh, and this is according to, to, to Morningstar. So, you know, is it probably better from an equity standpoint than the S and P as a whole? Yes, but this is not a value leaning mutual fund. It's just called the value line, which is a fund family. Uh, and, and, and so understand that difference. So I'm going to pass on this one. It's okay, but definitely wouldn't be nowhere near the top of the list of the type of uh, diversified mutual funds that are out there. Thanks for the call. This is Invest Talk. I'm Justin Klein, and I'm happy to take your questions right now at 888 chart. Each day, Invest Talk listeners submit their finance and investment questions via phone or email. Would you like your question to be put near the top of the list? Just take a minute or two to leave a review and rating for Invest Talk at iTunes. And be sure to include a brief question with your iTunes review comments. Now, my focus point today is based on this headline. Investors are are saying no to risky growth stocks and especially SPACs and the CNBC SPAC post deal index, meaning you know what the performance is after a merger of a SPAC and a target company, has fallen fifty percent this year. Yep, five zero, and this is after last year where SPACs were very hot; they were the hot ticket. And there's a combination of factors, obviously higher interest rates, uh, but a big part of it is regulatory crackdown on the things that these SPACs can say to entice investors, as well as disclosures they need to make. uh, And just the realization by these regulators that there's a lot of shady business going on in the SPAC world. And the complexity has caused a lot of trepidation. You know, when there's uncertainty in the market, the things that are least understood become less in value, right? Because people are focusing more on the risks, the downside, as opposed to when things are good, they just focus on what potentially great things this company could become. And so the general market volatility has dampened the enthusiasm for a lot of these SPACs. And there's some big laggards, uh, British online used car startup Kazoo, and mining company Core Scientific and autonomous driving firm Aurora Innovation, they're all down more, more than 80% this year. And even high, fo- high profile transactions that of SPACs that were proposed are also falling through. SeatGeek was one of them, and that fell through. And so what you're what you're gonna see over the next probably 12 months or so is a lot of these SPACs getting desperate. Remember, when they raise capital in their IPO, there's no company there. It's just a a bank account, basically, uh, invested in treasuries, typically. And that money is earmarked for some sort of acquisition, but they need to make that acquisition within two years. Otherwise, you have to return the money to shareholders. And all the money that the promoters spent on underwriting and everything, they're out. They're out of that money. It costs millions of dollars to 
get a company listed on the exchange to go public. And this is one microcosm. And it's usually when bear markets start, they tend to peak out. You know, the, the riskiest things tend to peak out the soonest. Uh, but it is an area that you want to watch because if you can really unpack the different names, there are bargains out there. High risk bargains, but bargains because there's in any time you have something where a whole space is off 50 plus percent, there's babies being thrown out with the bathwater. Now, in the SPAC space, 90 plus percent of it is just a money grab and just greed run amok. And there's really no substance behind these names, but that leaves five, 10 percent that actually are well run, that have good leadership, that are acquiring or have acquired a solid company at a reasonable price. But this is where value investors thrive, is finding opportunities like this. So understand that this is a lesson you should learn from this cycle, is not to just buy the hype. Understand when liquidity is loose, almost everything goes up. And often the junkiest, crappiest stuff goes up the most. But those are also the first to go down. If you notice, a lot of them peaked January, February, March of last year in the first quarter. Well, well before the broad indices. Broad indices went through a topping phase through the summer and into the fall. So they peaked six, nine months before the overall market. And that's where we're at. And this is a good lesson that you need to take home and internalize so you can make good decisions going forward. Now we get email questions from time to time. And here's one from a new listener named Mike. It says, quote, with the, with the news of FDA banning the Juul e-cigarettes, there's been a significant sell-off in Altria MO. I would like your thoughts. Is the sell-off an opportunity to buy for a long-term dividend? The answer for me on this is no. When there's big sell-offs in stock, I like his instinct, though. I'm going to give Mike a pat on the back for his instinct that you have a big blue chip name. You have some major news that brings the stock down 20%. Oftentimes, that's a market overreacting. The problem is in this market or in this situation, this is permanently impairing, in my mind, the jewel business, which they invested a lot of money, $31 billion in. And it just shows the regulatory backdrop here in the United States when it comes to cigarettes and e-cigarettes, which is not great. And so typically, like I said, when you get this big sell off in a blue chip, the instinct should be, I want to buy because it's probably temporary news. I think this is actually worse because it impairs it and it shows the regulatory backdrop that's bad. That's why I'd rather own a cigarette maker that's uh, around the world and has exposure there as opposed to here in the US. So no, no one MO. Now we're heading into a break. So I'm ready to take your calls right now, live at 888 chart Gearheads know that some projects need so many parts, it feels like you need a whole storage unit just to store them. That's what eBay Motors' 122 million parts are for. Think of it as your virtual parts garage. They've always got the right fitment at the right prices. Use the eBay Motors app or visit ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. This episode is brought to you by Verizon. Get a Verizon Business Unlimited plan from the network businesses rely on. Hey, Monica, with 5G Ultra Wideband in many more cities, you get up to 10 times the speed at no extra cost. Hello, downloads in no time. Plus, unlimited premium data and hotspot data to keep the signal flowing and your teams going. Come in or book an appointment with a Verizon business expert to find the right plan for your team. 5G Ultra Wideband available in over 1,700 cities with Business Unlimited Pro 2.0 smartphone plan. Speed comparison is to median Verizon 4G LTE speeds. Download speeds may vary depending upon network and coverage conditions and content optimization for 5G Ultra Wideband. Markets react to uncertainty. Are you prepared? Is your portfolio balanced? Is it optimized? Your financial future depends on the answers to those questions. Justin Klein is here now and ready to talk with you. Call Invest Talk 
888-99-CHART. Let's go to Los Angeles and talk to Sam looking at a couple of mutual funds. How are you doing, Sam? Yes, sir. So you're looking at VIPX and PARWX, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And you own these, looking to buy them. What's what's getting you interested in them? Uh, to buy them. Okay. And how did you land on these two? Well, they have very good returns. Okay. Uh, returns year to date, long term. How how are you classified? Long term. Long term. Long term. Okay. Yeah, they do have pretty solid returns, and one is the uh, let's see. Scrolling up here, Vanguard Equity Income Investor Class, VEIPX, 0.28% expense ratio there, which is uh, pretty solid. And performance wise, it's definitely held up much better than the market, down only 6% on the year. Last year was up about 25%. So I like that. Uh, the other one, Parnassus, Parnassus Endeavor Investor, much higher expense ratio, 0.88%. And performance-wise, it's down 15%. So it's definitely underperformed. Now, that had uh, better performance last year. It was up 31% versus the other one was up uh, 25 So Parnassus is definitely going to be a little bit more aggressive, uh, more volatility there, whereas the Vanguard one, you're going to get lower volatility uh, and lower expense ratio. So I think it depends. Both are large cap value. So you're leaning in the right direction. So I like that. But then the question is, you know, how much risk do you want to take? Uh, Vanguard value leans a little bit more on the value side. Uh, the or Sorry, Vanguard equity income leans a little bit more on the value side, whereas Parnassus leans slightly more on the growth. So if I'm picking one, I'm going with a Vanguard. Lower fee, a little bit lower risk, certainly outperforming in this market, and I like that. Okay, thank, thank you. Thanks for the call. Let's go to Mike in Michigan. And he wants to know how much, how to know when a stock has too much debt. Uh, hi, Justin. Uh, thank you uh, for taking the call. I, I love the show, and I'm, I've been gradually trying to move out of growth and into value after listening to you guys. But okay. um, I know sometimes you guys talk about doc, stocks have too much debt, and I, uh -huh. I, I use Fidelity as a broker, and I see different methods of measuring debt. There's like long-term debt to equity, there's mm -hmm. debt to assets, debt mm -hmm. to capital, current ratio. So how do you guys know when, what, and I see some measures are well over 100 or 200 percent ratio, and some are, you know, whereas the other ratio is maybe, you know, less. So how do you go about determining what's too much debt? It's a great question, and there's no one answer. I'll tell you that. Uh, you have to look at it compared to other companies in the industry. Uh, but most okay. importantly, you need to look at it in relation to the stability of their business and their cash flows. Some companies have wildly variable cash flows and profitability because they are price takers. Think of a lot of commodity companies. Price of the commodities mm -hmm. fall, that's the price they have to take. They need revenue. They need cash flow. They need to sell their product. Whereas other companies, think of consumer staples they have pretty consistent cash flows and earnings, not very cyclical. They have some pricing power, uh, et cetera. So you need to look at that first off because a snapshot of one year could mean anything in the context of a variable business that has a lot of variation to its, its cash flows. So that's number one is where is it lying in that full cycle? Okay. And then there's different okay. metrics like uh, current ratio. There's something called the Altman Z score. There's times interest earned, meaning how much are they earning compared to their, their interest they're paying on their debt, et cetera. All those need to be comfortable 
Um, Altman Z score, you want that to be high, not below two times interest earned. You want that to be you know, many multiples, uh, at least probably five times uh, the cost of its, of its interest, et cetera. So there's a lot of metrics that go into this. Um, there's debt to, uh, debt to equity. Uh, what's the measurement of debt compared to their, their assets, for example. Uh, so there's never one answer. And you okay. really have to understand it in the full context of the cycle. And that's what we do with the bonds that we buy for clients is, okay, what is it trading on? How variable and how risky is this business? Are they going to be able to pay uh, in a rough economic environment? And so I wish I could give you a straight, simple formula, but there really isn't. Um, it's really a complex picture uh, that takes many variables to consider. So thanks for the call. Now let's pivot over to debt since you're speaking about that. And what's interesting here is that many companies are now shifting their policy on issuing debt. A lot of you, a lot of companies are buying back their debt. They're pushing out maturities farther and they're reviewing their cash management strategies. And executives in recent weeks are pulling forward net debt sales or new debt sales. A lot of them were thinking of issuing in the back half of the year, but as rates are expected to rise, they're trying to get out in front of that. Other businesses are retiring their debt by using excess cash on their balance sheets, especially if you have variable debt. Uh, and they're planning to refinance that debt in later years. So they're pushing out if they, if they, uh, we're thinking about refinancing. They're saying, well, let's not do that yet at these higher rates. So some are bringing it forward. Others are pushing those debt, debt issuance back. One example, one that's pulling it forward, HP. They're helping finance uh, an acquisition of Poly for $1.7 billion, And they're retiring some debt. And that can happen when you own debt and it's callable. They can buy that back early. And then oftentimes they're going to refinance that at a lower rate. And if it was issued years and years ago, maybe yielding still higher. And what's interesting is bonds and loan issuances are down so far this year from the prior prior year. U.S. companies have sold roughly $553 billion in investment grade and high yield corporate debt through June 14th. That's compared to $815 billion during the same period last year. So certainly the higher borrowing costs, meaning less issuance, and that means less money to pay employees, to invest in new projects, uh, et cetera. And on their income statements, their earnings statements, cost of debt is going to go up as well for a lot of companies that are heavily indebted, especially those that have floating rate debt. And this is something that a lot of investors don't understand is that when you go and buy floating rates bond funds, those loans are typically to very risky borrowers. If you're a steady, strong borrower, you're an investment grade company, you're going to very likely have fixed rate debt. And so a lot of people look in a rising rate environment, they think, oh, I want floating rate debt because the, the, the interest is going to rise over time along with interest rates. Well, remember, there's two sides to bonds. There's duration risk and then there's default risk. And the default risk in a rising rate environment, and especially an inflationary environment like this, rises for a lot of companies, especially if you're kind of marginal. And so if you look at like BKLN, which is the Invesco Exchange Traded Senior Floating uh, Senior Loan ETF, which is a floating rate, that's so far down this year about, let's see, about 10%, which is kind of a lot for uh, a bond fund. And so the good news, though, is that U.S. corporations held about $3.8 trillion in cash in the first quarter. That's according to the Federal Reserve. That was $120 billion lower, though, than during the last quarter, uh, final quarter of last year, fourth quarter. 
but still a trillion dollars higher than before the pandemic. So while the economy is slowing and certainly the economic backdrop is getting more difficult, companies are flush with cash. Think of the PPP programs, remember? So we don't see a major default cycle yet, but that certainly could change. Now let's swing back to the Invest Talk Voice Bank for a call that came in earlier from a listener in San Francisco. Hi, Stephen, Justin. Love the show. Appreciate getting to listen to it and really appreciate you answering caller questions. This is Francis in San Francisco. And I have a question about ticker symbol SRS is an ultra short real estate ETF. And I was curious about what you think regarding purchasing a small position and going forth with rising interest rates, the current economic environment, and possibly any uh, defaults on mortgages. So would love your opinion. Thanks again for uh, taking caller questions. I love the show. All right, looking at SRS, which is the ProShares Ultra Short Real Estate ETF. And this is something, this is a good example of what I talked about the show. Everyone looks at the, they think, go into recession. What happened last recession? That's going to happen again. Uh Uh-uh. It's not the same. It's always different. Okay. So they want to use the same playbook and they think that, it's going to turn into a real estate crash. And I think the real estate market is going to slow pretty. It's already, it already has. Um, And I think there's probably going to be price declines nationwide, 10, 15, 20%. But that just brings you back to kind of where we were prepend around the pandemic. Right. And some economy or some markets will be worse. Bay area, Austin, Texas, those that are, have a lot of jobs in tech, I think those are going to be impacted the worst uh, areas that got a big boost during the pandemic, Phoenix, Arizona, Boise, Idaho, probably not as bad as Austin in the Bay Area, um, but those will probably uh, get hit. Uh, but nationwide, like I said, 10, 15 percent, I think is is standard, but there's not the same environment. When it comes to homes, there's not an oversupply of homes. In fact, there's still an undersupply. Uh, Inventory is rising relatively fast, but still at a low level. You have homes that are in the pipeline, but because of the cost of inputs, the home builders have been slow to build. Now, they are building a lot, and a lot's going to come on, but you're you're in a situation where we're already undersupplied in the number of homes in this country. Whereas 06, 07, we were oversupplied. There was way too much building. And then you added on top of that a very bad lending environment where people or or the the banks, as we know, made egregious loans. That's not the case anymore. So there's not going to be this glut of homes uh, foreclosures on the market because the vast majority of people that bought homes can afford them. Okay. So is the housing market going to weaken? Yes. How is it going to weaken? Yes. But that does not mean you have an 08 crisis again. One thing you have to learn, have to learn, the next recession is not caused or even similar magnitude than the previous one. It's always very different. Okay. Now, when you're looking at this SRS, the ProShares Ultra Short Real Estate, uh, this is making a bet. Let's take a look here. Uh yeah, real estate swaps. I doesn't. I don't think this is more uh, related to. I have to look at the prospectus. I think it's shorting home builders. I can't tell from just the holdings because they're using swaps and kind of complex instruments uh, with different banks. Yeah, basically that's what they're doing. You, they're, they're the banks are counterparties: Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, UBS, etc., Morgan Stanley. So I can't tell from this exactly what they're shorting, but. This isn't a name that I would, after this move, be that short, especially if rates have topped, if inflation's topped and the Fed's going to moderate their tightening cycle, I, I, I could see a big relief rally in this space. Um, so, and it's, remember, it's leveraged. It's an ultra short. So anything that's leveraged two times, three times, this is, uh, I believe, two times, you only want to use this as a short-term trading vehicle. 
meaning two, three weeks at a time, most. So this is something you hold longer term. Okay. So hope that helps. Hope that gave you a little bit of perspective on what this cycle is going to look like. And while I am a bit bearish on housing prices, I'm not that bearish on a lot of housing stocks because there's still demand out there. Uh, and how home builders, for example, their gross margins are at about 30%, which is much near record highs. But their gross margins typically are only in the 20, 25% range. So they have room to cut prices and still make, you know, kind of trend earnings. So are they over earning? Yes, but they're probably not going to go into negative earnings. Because once again, their margins already are above average. So hope that helps. This is the best talk. I'm Justin Klein. We have one goal here is to help you achieve your own version of financial freedom. And our work continues after this final break. So get your questions in now at 888 chart This is Invest Talk. Is your portfolio balanced? Is it optimized? Is it delivering the types of gains you want and need to achieve financial freedom? Well, turn up the volume because there are many questions that deserve unbiased answers. And Justin Klein is here now, ready to take your calls live. 888-99-CHART. Hi, Justin or Steve. I would like to get your thoughts on the oil and gas sector as of late, specifically Pioneer Natural Resources, ticker symbol PXD. They recently had a pullback nearing the 200-day moving average. I was wondering if you had an entry point or if you would wait a little bit. Thank you for all that you guys do. Bye. All right. PXD, and this is Pioneer Natural Resources. They're headquartered in Irving, Texas. They're an EMP company, mainly focused on the Permian Basin in Texas. They have about 2.2 billion barrels of oil equivalent. And oil and natural gas liquids represent 68% of production. So mainly focused on the oil side as opposed to natural gas, uh, which is okay. I still rather have natural gas, but more natural gas exposure than oil, but that's okay. Still doing very well. Obviously, earnings in 2020, only $2 per share, which actually not that bad compared to considering in 2020, oil prices went negative. They only lost money in one quarter. So that's impressive. So I like this company overall, their consistency of their business and their execution. Earnings this year is supposed to be $33 per share, trading at $230 per share. So based on this year's earnings, extremely cheap. But next year, expected to have earnings of $28.57, down 14%. Uh, but as with all oil companies and commodity companies, it's based on mainly the price of oil, price of their end product. And that's pulled back some. And I actually think for the balance of the year, you're going to probably go into more of a consolidation phase as the world just kind of deals with higher oil prices, the, com the economy slows, and that's certainly going to create some demand destruction. Uh, the sanctions on Russia, I don't think have had as much impact as the market is pricing in uh, to actual supply on the market because Russia, they're just basically selling oil at a higher price than they were pre-invasion pre and it's still a discount, but they're earning just as much money and they're selling it to places like India and China. And so oil is global market. So I actually don't, I'm not as bullish on oil for the balance of the year as I am on natural gas, which is harder to move. Uh, but when you're looking at oil companies, Pioneer is one of the best ones, uh, one of the better ones to say that. So I wouldn't chase the dividend that says 12.8%. I don't think they're going to, you know, probably maintain that longer term. Um, and the price does look to be pulling back near term. I'd be a bit patient. I'd be looking to pick it up around 180, 185 in that area. That's where I think there's uh, pretty good support. Yeah, yeah. And then the next support would be around 160. So uh, I think there's probably more pullback in the balance of the year for a PXD. And that's when I'd pick it up in that 175, 180 area. 
Thanks for the call. Now, lastly, let's touch on leveraged closed end funds. And with yields at rock bottom rates over the past decade, high net worth individuals have been looking for tax free income. And where they've turned are to closed end funds. They've got $60 billion in those closed end funds. And most of them employ some sort of leverage, often about a core, a third of their value of the fund is borrowed to amplify returns. And in the first five months, though, of this year, closed end fund muni funds returned minus 15.9%. And that's compared to minus 7.47% for the entire Bloomberg muni bond index that is not levered. So over double the loss so far this year. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Not only are the underlying assets falling because interest rates are rising, but now these funds are trading at a discount because people are selling willy nilly. The share price of closed end funds on average were trading at 93% of the value of the underlying bonds as of last Friday. And so that's a 7% discount. But this just goes to show you that when times are tough, people sell indiscriminately and leverage cut but cuts both ways during good times it amplifies returns and these leverage funds outperform but you can see how quickly that leverage can turn deadly and for a lot of these people they are retired nearly half investors of uh, all types of these closed-end funds are retired four million u.s households are invested in these funds half of those are retired So understand your risk and understand that leverage cuts both ways. I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. Steve Peasley and I thank you for listening. And we encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And be sure to rate and review on iTunes. And if you leave your question with your rating, we will prioritize your answer. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis, and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing.